Um, next up, we're going to talk a little bit about 404 permitting requirements with Mr. Steve Kessler. Um, Steve is a transportation engineer in the ETS division. He's worked in the environmental section of the DOT for 18 years now. Uh, Steve is a graduate from NDSU with a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering. Mr. Kessler, the group is all yours. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Murrah. Um, so like you said, my name is Steve Kessler. I work for the Department of Transportation Environmental Section. Today I'm going to go over uh, permit information, um, specifically milestone dates for permits, uh, final wetland information and 404 information, including wetland impact table updates, mitigation types, and common errors in permit information. So milestone dates, we've created milestone dates for all the permits needed to bid a project. Um, permits need to be obtained by the project's bid ready date. Um, this is crucial in uh, keeping the project development on time. For example, we have uh, projected end dates built into a milestone for 404 permits. 404 permit application information is needed three months prior to the bid ready date. This allows me time to review the information, make any comments, do any tracking, and also submit to the core and give them time to review the application and do the do the stuff they need to do and issue a permit. So the section 404 permit is actually needed two weeks prior to the bid ready date. This gives me time to create a permits SP and incorporate it into the bidder's proposal. So we've created checklists for all the permits um, needed to bid projects also. Um, all the permit checklists can be found in Appendix D of the reference form area of the design manual. The checklists are guidance. The checklist and guidance are in, informed designers of what is expected as a deliverable to the DOT and ETS section. Um, we are currently in process of updating these checklists and guidance and the wetland tables. Appendix D1 wetland information to environmental is uh, the specific checklist needed for submitting 404 permit information to ETS and final wetland submittal when a 404 permit is not required. So I thought I'd go over the uh, wetland impact table. Um, the first portion of the wetland impact table is obtained from a delineation report. Um, the next part of the table, the designers add the wetland impact information, whether the impacts are temporary or permit to the, the wetland. Uh, mitigation proposed, yes or no. If we plan to mitigate at a bank or on site, and you can see the yellow column in the on site area ditch shift um, we added that recently and finally the last two columns are the location of the wetland expansion so that's where we actually construct the wetland and the acreage of that wetland is going to get constructed to the other water impact table is pretty similar to the wetland impact table um, first part taken from the plans the acreage temporary and permanent of impact if mitigation is proposed yes or no and um, if we may get a bank or on site as Russ discussed, um, we do have another a, a new water type called other water Ds. We basically created the other water D table similar to the original other water table with parts taken from the delineation report, impacts, mitigation proposed, and the mitigation methods. We have summary tables for the wetlands and the mitigation. Um, in the summary tables for the wetlands, we have categories, whether it's natural or created slash artificial. Um, if it's jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional, um, this is needed for our tracking database that we have to do in the background. Uh, similarly, we have the mitigation summary table. Um, it's a total of all the impacts for the project and how we plan to mitigate for them. And we track those mitigation areas in our tracking system in the background. So mitigation, uh, the use of a mitigation bank or on-site mitigation should be determined during the NEPA phase. Um, we are we're trying harder to get this accomplished, and I think most of the time this, this can be accomplished. Um, Russ and I are working with our liaisons to, you know, better help identify these locations or these scenarios. Um, if you plan to use a bank, um, core mitigation 
if we plan to use a bank and mitigation is required for the core, uh, we'll need to plan to mitigate in the same RSA as the impacted water. The core requires mitigation to be in the same RSA. So the regional RSAs are regional service areas where basically um, water combined watersheds. So there are six RSAs in North Dakota. You can see we don't have banks in every RSA um, and a few of these banks are being close to being depleted. On-site mitigation. So we need to verify the hydrology. That's step one. And the general rule of thumb is 10 acres of watershed can support one acre of wetland. Uh, we need to pay attention and design the wetland to the lowest part of the wetland. Um, if there's a culvert associated with the wetland, design the mitigation below the culvert invert. Um, if it's a, maybe a larger deep type wetland, design the mitigation site a foot to a foot and a half below the wetland edge. We have received a few permits um, requiring mitigation for streams and deep water areas um, fairly recently. So in the future, we'll have future emphasis of for on-site mitigation for streams and deep water impacts. Might have to think a little bit outside the box for these. You know, some of the ideas we're spitballing is maybe removing sediment or putting a protection, buying a protective easement maybe. Um, but we're going to have to start thinking harder on these situations. So another mitigation type we call ditch shift, um, kind of a little bit self-explanatory. Um, this is for offsetting core ditch well and impacts that require mitigation only. These only apply to ditches. Um, in the figure, you can see there's a fill line being placed into the wetland. Um, the idea is to excavate the backslope for the same acreage of fill placed in that ditch wetland. So common errors I'm finding in permit information. Um, the, maybe the most common is permit information checklist is not being used, um, including and following the checklist and guidance in checklist and the guidance in it would address most of my common errors I'm seeing in permit information. The wetland impact table is not filled out correctly is another common error. Um, one of the things that has changed is the greater than a tenth of an acre mitigation threshold now applies to the entire project for the core and not just the wetland being impacted. Uh, another common error are impacts impact acres listed on the wetland impact table don't match the section 75 sheets. Um, Another error is we're not using the most current nationwide permit application form. The Corps has come out with a new application form specific to nationwide type permits. The Corps form number is 6082. Um, another error I'm finding is culvert extensions and culvert replacements not shown in section 75 sheets or the cross sections. Um, riprap is often not shown in the section 75 sheets. Rip, riprap is definitely a permit impact um, and it is a separate probably reference in the overall design plans, probably doesn't follow the limits of construction, so it's an easy one to miss. Um, not including detail sheets or box, not including detail, detail sheets, including box culverts or bridge details. Um, not clipping wetlands off the inslope. So roadway, the roadway footprint is considered previously authorized fill. So theoretically, we already permitted it for that impacted fill and mitigated for it or maybe prior to mitigation being required. Um, to do this, we need to find the original TOA slope of the constructed road. Um, so we should be looking at old plans. Um, old plans determine what the original TOA slope was for the construction. construction. We translate that uh, offset onto our new plan set um, and any area from the original TOA slope up our inslope and wetlands, we clip off the delineated wetland shape. So sorry, I kind of went through that as fast as I could to not keep you guys after class too long. Um, please let me know if there are any questions. Feel free to contact me. My email is here. Perfect. Thank you, Steve. Um, we do have uh, quite a few questions in the in the question and answer here. Uh, we'll go ahead and run through some of those. Uh, the first one, I'm 
just kind of go in order here. Matt, I think this one's going to be for you. I assume the definition of navigable is provided in the rule. There's a wide range on what is navigable, such as by canoe or by commercial barge. Does the rule provide limits of navigable? Uh, yeah, so that <clears throat> that's a uh, good question. I'm not a, uh, a lawyer. Uh, I know that the definition of navigable waters is in the section right after that. They're, they are they are all kind of connected um, because what happens with the waters of the U.S. rule, when we're talking about tributaries and commerce and, and things that are connected to other navigable waters. It does have something to do with, you know, when it connects to, uh, from this creek to this river to the Red to the Cheyenne to the Red River to the Hudson Bay. You know, those are the type of connections to a downstream navigable water. Uh, you know, and keep in mind, there's uh, you know, the state of North Dakota has their own definitions for navigable waters for North Dakota that the Water Commission has some programs they they regulate over. Um, so. Uh, yes, there is another definition for navigable waters that talks about the ebb and the flow and the tide and, and commerce. And then there's waters of the U.S. which are, you know, connected to those as well. And some of those are, I think, regulated under different programs, um, but they're all kind of related. Okay, perfect. Another question, uh, Matt, is would all of our ditches along the highways be ditches or tributaries or intermittent channels? Uh, you know, that's another good question. We've seen we've seen in some cases where, you know, like I said, we'll, we'll have like Russ is explaining these other water Ds or areas that are, you know, swales or other le low low spots and landscape that, you know, don't have any ordinary high water mark indicators or any hydric, any much of anything going on. But when you're out there, but like I said, there's been times where they, you know, we, we they, they've done field visits in, in March and yeah, it's full of snow and it was called a, an ice or whatever and it was called an intermittent tributary. And then there was other times um, they they would do a field visit and see something and come and do another one and it all be gone. And they, they would, sometimes they would call that an ephemeral feature. Yeah, but that's actually these a follow-up question to that. Yeah, and that, that's kind of the hard part in North Dakota we're not like Texas, Arizona. We have a winter season and a summer season. Both have, I'll just say, or, or spring and summer have their own violence to them, right? Like we get these huge thunderstorms or when, you know, we do have a lot of snowpack and ice and it melts, you know, so it's tough to tell. Well, did this mark on the, uh, or this ordinary high water mark uh, appear because of the melting of the snow or did it appear from that four inch rain last July? You don't, so some sometimes they're they're called intermittent tributaries on the basis of snowpack melting, and in other cases um, they've determined some of these features in our ditches are ephemeral features and and exempt. Sure. So and that kinda, that's the hard part, and and that's why it's kind of going back and forth a little bit, and and it's it's very difficult to to uh, generalize and and try to predict some of this. Sure, that kind of leads into the next question there. I think you've answered most of it. Is uh, so given the, the definition of intermittent streams and the Army Corps saying that uh, snow in North Dakota counts as snowpack, does yep. that mean that every stream in North Dakota will be considered at least an intermittent stream or is it possible that some could be considered ephemeral? Uh, good question. Like I said before, it, it's been a little of each. So I, sure. I think it just it just depends on on what they see in the field, maybe what when when they do their site visits, if they do a site visit, what time of year our delineators were out there. What did our delineators find? What what did they think? What did the the science tell them? I mean, they were out there, and and it's a little it's a little of each. So, um, uh, yeah. But I mean, I, I would say most of the time, if 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 you're out there as a delineator and, there, and and there is a stream, it's it's likely intermittent and perennial. I mean, we're talking about mainly the the thing we're seeing are these dry areas. That normally, say a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have even stopped and taken a look at because it's just all upland grass. There's no ordinary high water mark or bed and bank. Well, now we're having to stop and look at these areas because on the aerials they look like they're susceptible areas to drainage, and they want an analysis done, and and that's where that determination's got to come in. Sure. So there's kind of a lot of moving parts. So it's it's that uh, you know we're just trying to do the best we can. And then one last question before we end it here. Um, do you know what our snowpack was in 2020-2021? Uh, I bet not a lot. Uh, I don't. I, I know that I looked at a map the other day and the whole state was under severe drought. So yep. I'm, I'm thinking little to nothing. So yep. that, that's a great point. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Very good. Well, 
I think that's going to be uh, it for questions. If any other questions come in, certainly feel free to reach out.